Hello, and welcome to So You Want to Build a Video Game, A Guide to Get You Started, Part 3 on BaltimoreGamer.com. My name is Matthew Moriello, and recently I got a chance to sit down with Daniel Mannard of Crankshaft Games to talk about their new game, Party of Sin. Party of Sin is a puzzler, platformer, shooter concept based on the seven deadly sins. And I wanted to bring this in the form of a podcast because Daniel has a lot of interesting things to say. I also thought this would be a great opportunity for our readers to be inspired by a large independent project that's in the final phases of production. So with that, I'll go right into the interview. First question is, how did you get involved with game development and what's your, beyond being the founder of Crankshaft, what's your role in Party of Sin? All right, cool. So well, in terms of what got me into game development, I mean, I've been doing it I've had an interest in it since I was a kid, right? Like, you grew up playing video games, and then at some point I was like, hey, I could probably, like, change these games, make them cooler. And it started off with, I was, like, 12, and I picked up a programming book, and I was, like, always interested in it. My, my dad used to program on the computer, and I was always uh, really curious about it. And he, would, he was talking about how he made, like, chess games or whatever when he was a kid, like, in basic. Right. So he kind of got me started on that. I picked up Java and started developing like clones of games. I was doing like Tetris clones and I, I, I used to play with StarCraft, like modify StarCraft, like switch out sounds and stuff like that. <laughs> At one point my StarCraft installation was really messed up and I had like, you know, like kitten sounds when the Marines were shooting or whatever. Right. So it started with that and then I started getting more and more involved in the mod community, which is where Crankshaft started. So. I was working on Battlefield 1942, which was a game that I really, really loved. And then it started coming out with modding tools. So I was adding like space, spaceships and stuff to Battlefield 1942. And that kind of started off the whole, it started off Eternal Silence, which was the mod that I worked on before Party of Sin. It started off for Battlefield 1942. I developed it on Battlefield 1942 for like a year. Okay. And then I got really like, pissed off at the engine and, and like people were like oh the game's not that good so I was like okay whatever I'll just start it over and I rewrote the whole thing for Half-Life 2 okay right that's um, the game I was thinking about was Half-Life and so I was like yeah Half-Life yeah. okay and I mean the the first one looked like crap you can still find it on the internet but it looked horrible but I think I started that one when I was like 13 and the Half-Life 2 one was when I was like 15 or 14 Wow. So started pretty really, really young. Like everyone else was like having fun drinking or whatever. I mean I still did some drinking, but uh, Of course, of course. Right. I was like working on video games in the evenings and it was really it was really cool. Yeah, that that's awesome as just about anything is better the younger you start, right? You get Yeah, exactly. You get so much more exposure and So I mean after working on Party of Sin for like four or five years, it was like a really long project, super ambitious. I kicked off like Party of Sin about three years ago, and I've been working on that since then. Okay, so I guess as a point of reference, how old are you now? 24. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's like super impressive then. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I've been developing games for 12 years, which is <laughs> like, it seems like a really long time considering how young I am. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Old. Well, that's what happens when you start young, right? Well, so this is this is a good segue. So my my column is about people who haven't had any experience really in game development coming into it for their first time and you know, most of the projects that you start when you're first starting out, you you don't finish them, you know, and a lot right, of people yeah. realize how challenging it is and say, "Oh, that's, you know, that they'd be cool, but it's just not for me." So my first question related to that is so we were talking about basically coming up with ideas. Where did the idea uh, of Party of Sin come from? Like, how did you develop it? Okay. I usually, like, my ideas, the, the kernel of my ideas are usually really, like, stupid things, and then they end up, I end up, like, attaching a fantasy to it and all of that. So, I mean, with Party of Sin, I wanted to make a simple game, simpler than Eternal Silence, which uh, I thought would take, like, a year to develop, and now we're, like, three years into it, so that's clearly not what happened. But right. <laughs> I wanted to make a simple game, some kind of like top-down shooter uh, was the initial idea, and I was like, oh, you know, I played, I, I heard about Ikagura, which was this like Japanese like bullet hell game where you could switch colors between black and white, and if you were, if you got hit with a, a, a bullet of the same color as you, you got like, a, it absorbed and it like healed you, and if you got hit with a bullet of a different color, it like do damage. 
So I was like, man, let's just like throw like a whole bunch of colors in there and like make it really cool and like, and then with the colors, it started looking at like what could be associated with color, right? And you get like sins and all that. So it kind of just built up from there. And I try to, I mean, I went to the game design workshop a few times at GDC and they have like a really cool way of thinking about games. Like games in general, you can think of having at like three levels, right? There's like the mechanics of the game, which is where the game designer works. There's the, it's like the dynamics of the game. It's like the emergent gameplay, like what happens, like the, how do the mechanics interact to make something that's fun? And then the top level is like aesthetic, right? And aesthetic is like, you know, what the game feels like, like what the game makes you feel when you play it or whatever. And a lot of game developers kind of do it bottom up. So you're thinking about the mechanics first and then you try to like imagine what the aesthetic is going to be. I, and one of the things that the game design workshop tries to push in the battle and game designers is to like go the other way around. Like think about your aesthetics first. So think about like how you want the game to feel for the players and then build a game that has mechanics and dynamics that kind of match that. So start off with Party of Sin, we're like, okay, we want to feel kind of like we're, you know, a bit evil, like you're playing as a sin, you're kind of impulsive and you don't really think through your decisions, you're just kind of like a slave to your vices, right? Right. So I was like, if we start with that, like, what would be powers or what would be, like, a gameplay dynamic that would kind of match that? So we're like, oh, you know, you'd be, like, backstabbing each other all the time. Like, you're kind of working together, but you're not, you're not friendly. Like, you're, you're, you're an evil, like, mean person because you're, you're, like, embodying the sin, right? So Mm -hmm. it kind of just, like, evolved from that. And then we try to build all our mechanics to match that aesthetic. I I think of, like, the D&D alignment chart where you're thinking about, like, you're, like, chaotic, neutral, chaotic evil amongst your team members. That's kind of how I... I, My take on on your explanation there. Yeah, and, I mean, I'm not... I I have, like, a really... uh, I have a certain process and, like, style that I follow. Like, I really... Like, games that are heavy on mechanics, I feel, are, like, RPGs and things like that. Like, games where you're basically, like... It's a whole bunch of stats, right? Like, you pick up a weapon in Diablo or something, and you just get, like, a stat sheet. And right. this weapon has, like, four DPS and, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's it's very focused on the mechanics. You're, you're kind of, like, almost at the same level as the game designer when you're when you're looking at these stats and these weapons. Um, but then there's games where you really don't have that. Like, you think of Zelda and, like, the items that you pick up. It's like, oh, you pick up this hammer and, like, it can do a whole bunch of different things. And you, the designer kind of sets up a language with you, right? Right. So they're like a certain item will interact with something else like a bomb can interact with like a wall that's tainted a certain way that you know that you can destroy that wall with a bomb but there's no like explicit communication so it's like on a higher level like you don't have you don't have the stats for the bomb right you don't say like oh the bomb does 100 damage uh, for a radius of 5 units around it or whatever so I try to like appeal to players on that level instead of trying to bring them down to to like mechanics where they really have to understand like everything that goes on. I mean, I guess so. So that's that's certainly one approach. My thought is there's some players that might actually really enjoy that mechanic interaction where you know they they just love stats and they love to know exactly how this is like functioning. So I guess that's just sort of a a play perspective of the gamer themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just my style. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's a personal it's a personal choice. And I mean, I I'm not a huge fan of RPGs myself. I mean, I try, I, I I try RPGs because I want to like RPGs, but then I always get bogged down in the stats and stuff. And I'm like, oh, why can't this just be simple? Right. And so, but I, I make games that I would like to play. <laughs> I mean, I think I take the alternate perspective on RPGs as I I enjoy them, but I'm not heavily into the stats although it's kind of it's it is kind of forced upon you right because you have to it, especially if you if you get involved in player versus player combat it's all about the stat game and and then the skills i feel especially in like the bigger mmos tend to be kind of secondary to that stat game which sort yeah, of started I, killing it most of play, like what what i feel in rpg sells me like when i start playing an RPG, like i play mass effect or i play like i don't know oblivion or something and I haven't played. I haven't even played Skyrim yet. I, I've been Ooh. trying to find time. To play yeah. Skyrim. But 
you know, what, what I feel it sells is like, oh, you know, you're like the hero in like this large, this large uh, world and you start off like small and then you become like stronger and stronger and stronger until you like can do whatever you want basically. And I mean, I, I, RPGs ultimately fall short of that for me because I'm like, you know, I'd really like to just role play in, in the pure sense of the word, like become a character that I, that I'm not in real life and then like embody that and I feel like the whole statistics thing kind of pigeonholes you into becoming like a warrior or a mage or something like something that's destructive you don't have a chance to like explore the world on a different level and it's also kind of like an RPG if, if you really think about it is like is all about putting you in this world and they kind of oversell it right they're like oh you know you can like get love interests and like you can do all of this stuff like in Mass Effect and in reality, like there's not there's not, there's a lot of stuff you can do, but there's not that much depth except in the combat. Like the combat has tons and tons of depth, so it's obvious that you're supposed to, you know, fight. <laughs> but the game will try to sell you that you can do anything. And I think there are there are, there are games that do that better than others, of course. Maybe not like Mass Effect, although I don't have a lot of experience with that. But I mean, I think you know the the Skyrim Elder Scroll sort of series does a pretty good job at mm-hmm. giving you a lot of options even though you know the core is go out and fight right so you know backing away from talking about games because i'm sure we could go on and on about different game types so so you've got this idea for party of sin it's 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 nice and simple and you've got this developing narrative around it i mean i guess so what were your first sort of development steps that you took once you had this core idea i mean did you immediately go into developing a prototype or did you start like getting feedback on that idea from you know friends family others Uh, i started i mean people okay like get telling people your ideas is kind of pointless because everyone's got ideas there are a dime a dozen i mean there's there's really there's there's not much point like your friends will tell you like oh yeah it's a good idea and you'll have a bunch of people that say like no that's stupid like what are you doing and then like there's no there's no validation like you can't you can't gauge an idea just by telling people about it. You gotta like implement it, right? I mean, the first thing I did was write up a design document to like start getting the thoughts on paper. And I don't write like super, super long, like 200 pages design documents. It's just like a, you know, three, four pages, like really flesh out what each character is supposed to be doing, what the gameplay is about. And then I went on to hire. I got, I got an artist, which was one a guy that I was working with on Eternal Silence. So it was a guy that I already, already kind of knew, and I was like, hey, would you be interested in like doing another project? So you just like start discussing stuff like that. And then the first thing we did was build a prototype. And it was just like a simple, like we used XNA, like a week long, just like coding spree of a prototype. Like it had tons of bugs. Like if you held on the jump key, you could actually like hit the ceiling of something and then like latch onto the ceiling and kind of like move like Spider-Man. <laughs> it nice. was weird. But uh, no, that's that's a developing mechanic, you know, that you're gonna eventually yeah, implement, right? I mean, no, we didn't. We didn't actually use that. <laughs> it was just a silly bug that was in our prototype. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, we started with that, and we we're like, oh, you know, I think this could actually work, and then just like can the whole prototype and started like building the engine and the game for real. I mean, it really depends. Like me being a programmer, I kind of get all like giddy for all the tech stuff. So we built our own engine, and it was it was partially because like I actually wanted to do it. But if you're in it just to make games, if you're in it just to like express yourself and be a game designer and all that, like you're way better off just like using some kind of tool that already exists, like Unity or, or UDK or something like that. And then I uh, start building the game and, and start getting feedback and tweaking it. I mean, we spent we kind of made a few mistakes through development. I mean, because it's a single player game, there's kind of a tendency to want to hold back a lot because you're like, oh, I don't want to ruin the punchline. I don't want to like, you know, tell people the story before they play the game and kind of realize at the end, like that's totally pointless because you have to get the feedback early on. You have to get people like trying your game out. And we went through a whole bunch of iterations on the gameplay. Like the longest part of Party Sin wasn't the engine or anything like that. It was just like finding what's fun and then like, spreading that all over the game right right and I, and I um, think that's probably one of the most that's certainly one of the hardest things to do right is you've got this idea and, and then and, and you're it's going to be fun and then you, you build something you get people to start playing it and now you got to figure out like how how is that tra- how is your idea translating and how can you improve that for the player experience because it's not yeah. about 
building for you. It's about building for them, right? So we, we kind of you kind of touched on my next question, which was just you know going through iterations of you know design build feedback design build feedback that sort of process yeah you wouldn't believe like we started party of sin like so far off the mark like our initial plan for the game was to make it like a a 2d side scrolling like shooter right like a run and gun right so you'd have a gun all the time and then you only had a basic gun and you would use your sin powers like between shooting to you know do something to the angels like you could you know slow them down or stun them or whatever and then we, we did that for like two years and it kept going like we had the guns in the game and then we're like oh you know the guns are not that fun like we only have one type of gun let's just add like 16 types of guns so now we have like flamethrowers and grenade launchers and shotguns and like everything you can imagine and then last year like last summer we're like you know like people don't, don't use the synth powers like there's really no difference between the synths because they all have the same gun selection right so we're like you know the whole point of this game was to get people to like use these synth powers right <laughs> And they were like, oh, crap, like, we're trying to make a shooter where we don't want people to shoot. So we just cut the guns. Not completely. There's still, like, pickups that you can get in the game. But the, the game is, like, an essentially switched from being a shooter to, like, just now a, a beat-em-up. Like, you can use your, your melee weapon. And then you're supposed to use your sin power to do everything else. Like, you have to, you know, pull in angels from the sky. And, and you can do range damage with NP's laser and stuff like that. Like... It was a complete change. It was like the smallest code change we ever made, but it was like completely changed the dynamics of the game. And so I guess that raises kind of an interesting question is, you know, as you're you're building this game and, you know, you put so much time in it, and then it sounds like you decided that you're actually going to take a step back and and redevelop a little bit what you'd been doing. And so is that a difficult decision to make? And, you know, how how did that kind of affect your development process or was it just like okay well we got to make this change and we do it and it goes forward because a lot of people get really attached to what they're it's, working it's tough, on because you have, there's like always a there's kind of a mental resistance right there's like you you don't want to like throw out work that you've done and like the same to the same token like we thought like our initial plan for party sin if, if, if i'd pitched it to you like two years ago we would have been like oh yeah like we have you know shooting we have platforming we have puzzles and you have like all these different sin powers and there's like 50 different elements in the game right and it's partially just because like at some point like at the beginning you're just kind of throwing everything you can at it you're like yeah we could do this we could do this and then you realize like at some point you kind of have to turn around and say like you know is this really fun like is are people getting any enjoyment out of this or is this just like stupid frustrating like we realized like our initial concept for the game had like heavy platforming like you would be you know jumping between moving platforms and you'd be like Mario right and there's a lot of things that contradict each other. Like, that's the thing. Like, you want to make a game where you're Mario, but shooting. So it's like, to be a shooter, you have to have big targets. So you have to have, like, your player is, like, more vertical, like, tall, right? But to be Mario, you have to be a tiny little square thing that has, like, really crazy acceleration, and you jump around, and you have air control and everything. And so it's like, we we, we had the tall characters because we wanted to be a shooter first and foremost. And then, as we're building these platforming areas, you know, you've got, like, crushers, and you've got platforms moving around and like your acceleration is slow because you you can't move too fast otherwise you can't shoot far enough like relative to your to the size of your character right right and you're you're like a vertical box you're you're like this vertical box if you're jumping around and you're trying to go fast and like platformers is all about building up this rhythm of like jumping right You're, you're jumping and you're moving around and stuff and then all of a sudden like your whole shooting mechanic is completely contradictory to that and so we had to can the platforming. We had to can, like, the guns. And now we're just, like, a puzzle platformer game. Like, you, I mean, platformer in the loose sense, where you're just, like, your side-scroller mm-hmm. with puzzles, and you have your sim powers. And, I mean, the game is, like, immensely simplified. But it's it, it, the simplicity allows you to, like, actually, you know, discover the sins in depth instead of just having, like, a whole bunch of stuff that you can do that in the end is not very exciting or very cohesive. Right, and I mean, I think that's it's certainly a hard thing for me to do is throw out, you know, work and take that step back. I mean, eventually you, you end up doing it anyways, but there's I feel like there's a lot of frustration that around that point. I, I don't know. For us, it was like when when we when we actually thought because we had spent so much work on the guns, right? Right. And we kind of had that eureka moment that was like, oh my god, we don't need guns, and all we did was remove the default guns. So like, you could still pick up weapons, 
but then like if you know so in the sense it didn't go to waste like we still have guns in the game but they're like way minimized now like we had spent a lot of work on upgrades for guns like we had a gun shop at the end of the level that you could like upgrade the guns and we're probably going to cut that because it makes no sense now right but it's tough but you just got to like do it like you just got to keep moving forward that's that's the key like I, I look at the game like through three years of development like every single month or three months or whatever I look back and I'm like man the game sucked back then <laughs> and like, now it's awesome and it's happening all the time right like, and it's just constantly getting better and right and and it is awesome I, uh, I had met Liz Hollerman and first heard about Party of Sin at a, kind of an indie games presentation here at DC, where I was uh, I was demoing a a mini game for the iPad that the uh, IGDA DC and myself had been working on, and I'm really glad that we went for Liz because afterwards she completely stole the show. It was probably the most impressive thing at the events. Although there were a lot of like good projects, just like interesting things people were working on. And I think what impressed me the most was that she had said that you know, not only had you guys been working on this for several years, which is just a huge accomplishment, but also that you're a a very remote, kind of globally positioned team. Like, you have members all around the world. So I, I guess that brings up an interesting question is, like, how did you how did you recruit and meet up with all these different people and talents? And what type of, uh, of background and experiences are you all coming from? I mean, the whole global global team thing is kind of like a product of being in the mod community. I mean, like, when you look at any... If you look at any of the Half-Life 2 mods, like, they're pretty much all in the same situation. Like, you've got maybe a couple of guys that are in the same city, but then most of them are just, like, randoms from all over the world. Like, they're just people that, like, hey, I like your idea, I want to help you out, like, I'll make you this, you know, AK-47 model. <laughs> and that's really cool. Like, it's a, it's, it's a really great resource because you get talent from everywhere. The problem is, like, keeping it cohesive and, and keeping in communication with these people because it's really tough. Like, when I was on Eternal Silence, we always had, you know, a couple of people that are, like, comets. Like, they're on, like, this really wide orbit, and they, they come by, they work intensely for two months, and you get, like, some really awesome stuff, and then they disappear for a year and a half, and you never see them. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're still working a year and a half from there, they'll come back, and they'll be like, hey, what happened? Like, you know, I, I've been working on this stuff, and, like, here. <laughs> so... With any team, there's, like, a core... Like, we have a core of maybe four people on Party of Sin that are, like, we're in constant, constant contact with, and then we have kind of, like, sub-teams. Like, in, like Liz in Virginia is working with three or four of her ex-students that have, like, graduated and are, like, helping her out, and she's in constant, constant communication with them, but, like, I don't speak to them that often. Like, we hang out, but... I, I don't, I don't, you know, manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it kind of has like that. It's important to have like that hierarchy and be able to delegate. Definitely, and it, it sounds like that's been very successful for you guys. My question is, you know, what kind, what, what is, what is your? I mean, you've kind of touched on a little bit, but what is your management or organizational style like? Are there? You kind of said that you know you're not in constant contact with any everyone, but are there? tools and things that you're using that kind of make that, that facilitate that communication channel? I mean, we used to use, when I was on Eternal Science, we used the forums like like crazy. Like, we used to have these online forums that are, like, you know, private for the team, and then you would, like, post stuff, and people would reply with criticism, and they'd say, like, it is especially good for artists, right, because they're working on models and stuff, and they want people's opinions. And I started doing that with Party of Sin, like, kind of similar style, but then it, it quickly, like, fell apart. Like, you kind of it was people were talking too much for the forum like you're, you're just like there's too much evolution to like be documenting all of this on, a, on an online forum so what ended up happening is like we, we pretty much use like Google Talk and Skype and we're just like constantly talking to each other it's uh, every single day like a couple of hours a day at least we're just like chatting and like you know here's what's going on here's what I did like check it out it's, it's on the subversion server and I mean, my in terms of my management style, like I, I, you know, you, I've gotten a lot more mature, I guess, in the last few years. But I mean, my, my style now is, is really like I, I, you know, get talented people, like get people who are really passionate about it. Like Liz is is like extremely, extremely passionate, and very, very dedicated to the game, and it's just like you know, get out of their way, like get let them do what they need to do to fulfill their their mission or their task and then just like support them as much as possible like i i 
you know, I, I won't go in and tell an artist exactly how he should model something or tell an artist, like, what I want to look like. I go, you know, I tell them, like, we need a character. Here's his position in the story. Here's what I think he should maybe look like. You know, you take it from there. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's some cases where we do throw out work because it, it's just not cohesive. Like, and you know, one guy makes a one-off model and it's just, like, weird. And then, like, oh, crap, we can't really use this. But the people that, that start to understand the the style of the game and the concept like it works really really well for them because you know we, we give them the creative freedom to do like cool stuff and just recently like Liz worked on a narwhal for the hell like we because we had we had this level where you're like riding a lava turtle in hell and she she just like made this narwhal because she's like I think this is really cool and I was like I have no idea where we can put this in the game but I'll try to find a spot <laughs> and now it's like a mini boss that we have like halfway through uh through hell and it's like it's actually really really fun so I mean it you know I, I just kind of let people loose and see what they come up with so you, you, you're sort of you're sort of blending some of the aspects of the close-knit team agile development but it's more of an organic sort of let's present some ideas and everybody run with it and we'll come back and we'll see how it's all yeah. jiving right so, yeah, I mean, I, we, we, it has some downsides because we're, like, not very good at keeping schedules. <laughs> of course. But the quality of the game is, like, it, it just grows immensely. And now we're at kind of at the point, like, since since last year, we've been at the point where it's like, okay, we want to get this finished. Like, we're tired of, like, just throwing, making stuff up as we go along. Like, let's, you know, we, we've set a scope and we're like, the game is going to be finished when we get these features done. And, like, you know, that's it. Like, we're we're not... And we're still taking feedback from testers and all that, and we're, like, working out solutions for that, but we're not adding new stuff, or as little as possible at this point. And, and so I guess that brings up an interesting question, which is, so you, you said you've, you've kind of locked the scope at this point, and you're taking feedback, but you're not implementing new things. Does that Has that been reflected in those early game design documents that you might have developed? Are you keeping kind of logs and keeping track of that sort of stuff? What do you mean? Like, do we do we update the design the design doc or? Yeah, or do you have like a like maybe a, a revision log or a, you know something to track changes? It's, it's kind of like we're, we're it's very organic. Like we have, I mean, we have like initially we set out to make whatever like twenty or twenty five levels, and then we're like, okay, we're cutting it down. We're gonna do like you know eighteen, or we're gonna do sixteen, or you know we we've kind of like reduced the scope of certain things that we're like you know we really don't have the resources to get this done, so we're gonna have to cut it down. And I mean, it happens with any game. Like, it's not, it's not unusual that you have to cut things out because you you need to finish. Like, it's important that you get the game done. But we, I, I mean, we do keep a log and we do kind of have keep track of the features and stuff. But it's very organic. Like, we set milestones, you know, two or three months away, and we say like, this is what we want for this milestone. And then after that, like, we'll get some feedback from testers and we'll see what people say, and then we'll set the next milestone. But like at this point we're we're pretty much like complete on the design and we're just like finishing up to art all the levels and making like tweaks tweaks and adjustments that's mainly uh, the stage that we're at now right so i guess that kind of moving on to a different level we, we talked about kind of the team dynamics that are going on you're you're all around the world you you know there's communication is strong among certain people and you know, not as strong amongst other team members, and, and other team members are either even cycling through. You know, they come in every couple of months and drop some work off, and then you don't see them. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, that that happened more for Eternal Silence. Oh, okay. And I made a specific, I made a very specific promise to stop that from happening for Party of Sin. Like we have a contract, we have a an agreement between us that it's. You know, to bring someone on, we need 75% approval. To bring, take someone off, we need 75% approval. And there's, like, it's, it's this whole, like, partnership agreement. And it's it means that it's actually a lot more work to bring someone on. And we don't do it all the time. Like, we want to keep the team small and very, like, tightly tightly knit. Right. And that's worked out so far. Like, we don't have... We, we've had a couple of people that have, like, come in and then not stayed very long. But we don't keep them around very long. And, and when they're they're gone, like, they're, they're gone for good. Like, we don't... We're not going to keep around, like, people that don't contribute because it's just too much overhead, like, on us to, to, to be, like, training these people and, like, explaining them what to do. And then finally, like, they don't deliver. Right. And I think that's an important sort of decision to make for any kind of team that I, I can totally see that helping a lot of other teams out there. Like, you know, you just have to sort of have this agreement and you got to stick to it, right? 
Yeah. So I guess that that kind of addresses some of the like internal challenges that you guys face. And so maybe moving on to what kind of tools and resources you have available for the team. So what what are you currently developing Party of Sin in, and what kind of what kind of resources have been available to the team outside of like your personnel resources? Like, is there any outside factors that are contributing to Party of Sin? I mean, we're we're building the game on XNA right now. It's on like a custom engine, so we like we're we're, we're off the base XNA, but XNA is just like a, a wrapper around DirectX, basically. Like, it's a simple. I mean, it has a couple of like libraries for to replace boilerplate code, but it doesn't have very much of a an engine. It's not like you can just start importing assets and, and display them. So we built the whole engine on top of that. That's mainly my work. And then we do have a couple of like tools. Like we have a tool set that we wrote up in 3 Studio Max, like using Max Script. So uh, it's a tool set that will like have you know it has like these custom entities that we can use and like you can hook them up with events so that you can kind of script things in the level and then it exports the whole thing into XML and then you just go from there like you build up your level that way. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like external resources, I mean we we hire people, but there's not really been any. Like, we don't have contractors or, like, sponsors or anything like that. Like, it's been strictly self-funded. And we, I mean, we all put in our time. We haven't really been putting in that much money. But we just had the Kickstarter, like, last month. So that was, like, a huge, like, that was great because that pretty much took care of our expenses uh, so far. And for, like, the rest of development, it's going to cover, like, licenses and stuff. I mean, it doesn't, it's not going to get the game done faster or, like, you know, like give us more time, but you're going to feel better doing it, right? (laughs) Sorry. You're going to feel better doing it, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it covers the travel and it covers like the licenses, uh, the software licenses and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's like, uh, but yeah, I mean, there hasn't really been like, I I mean, we like, we have our physics engine is like box duty. So we just like imported that. Uh, but aside from that, there's really not much stuff coming from outside. Like it's really all, internal like part of the, the team that made just about everything and and box 2d is open source javascript uh platform? it's on it's in all kinds of languages like okay. it was originally written in c plus there's ports for c sharp and flash and javascript for sure like there's everything yeah i've uh, recently started because using like it i don't have the expertise to build a physics engine myself <laughs> right or well, it's a lot right <laughs> yeah but it, i mean so still though you know, you, your time is probably, you know, your most important resource, and you guys have all been putting in your time unpaid, so that has to kind of have some, you know, hardship or sacrifice involved there. Yeah, um, so I mean, it, there's some psychological, uh, like, like the people, you know, like Liz works, like, I don't know, 80 hours a week or something, like, we're all, like, at this point, we're all working, like, insane hours. I've been planning to, like, leave my job soon, because I want to start doing this full-time. I mean, for me, it's always been a passion of mine. So, I mean, with the Kickstarter and stuff, I feel, like, comfortable that, like, you know, I can do without the income in order to, like, keep keep building this game and, like, finish it off and then work on subsequent games. Right. So, uh, I mean, of course, Kickstarter is a phenomenal resource for anyone not familiar with it. And you guys just had an extremely successful campaign where you, you know, you not only achieved all of your goals but you know i think you went even further than you maybe expected you know you were working on this game for several years before you even approached kickstarter so you know how do you feel about the kickstarter platform and uh when did you make that decision to go for it you know like and actually reach out through kickstarter i mean i've been super super happy with it i i I didn't know kickstarter existed until like last november because what would what was happening is like we were you know We went through some tough times. Like, game development is not easy. You go through times where you, like, hate the game and, like, you hate the team and, like, nothing's going well and it (laughs) seems like no work is getting done. I mean, that stuff happens, okay? I'll I'll be straight up with you. And, I mean, last October, November was, like, a bad, a really bad time for for the team. Like, Liz Liz was busting away for the art, but, I mean, the rest of this, like, there was not very much development for anything else. And so I was looking for something that we could, like, you know, as a team, like, finish and like make a make a milestone or whatever so someone ended up suggesting that we should go to PAX which is like PAX East right in Boston which is going to be like next week right 
and then we're like, oh, we should totally do that. Like, how much the booth, co booth costs? And it's like fourteen hundred dollars. We're like, man, it's a lot of money. Not everyone on the team has enough money to like contribute, because like we do have like a revenue share set up. So you know, if if we're all gonna pitch in to do packs, like you expect it to be about proportional to the the revenue share, like. Some people had like to give in fifty dollars, but some people had to give in like three hundred dollars. Right. And it's it ends up for people that aren't making very much money or they're students, like it ends up eating up their budget. So one of our guys on our team was like, Hey, we could do Kickstarter and I was like, What the hell is that? And then <laughs> we started looking into it and it seemed to make a lot of sense and we kinda of planned to do it. Because we could we could like prepay for packs, like pay the first installment, and then that's what we did, and then we were like, Okay, we'll get the rest of the money with Kickstarter, like before the deadline. So that's kind of how it how it happened. Like we weren't planning on needing any external funding, but then when when we kind of thought, you know, like if we really want to make this happen, if we really want to finish this game properly and not it be not like, you know, leave it where no one knows about it, we have to start doing PR. We have to start like spending money on trade shows and like advertising and whatnot. So it kind of rose out of a need for that. And I mean, it, it has really helped because it's kind of like focused the team on like a single objective, which is like go to PAX and like finish the game. Mm -hmm. And been really amazing like the last few months. And since we made that decision to just go for it, um, the last few months have been like super, super productive and like everyone's happy. No, oh, that's that's awesome. And so you were also you were just at GDC. You're going to PAX next week or two weeks from now. It's like the first weekend of April, first full weekend of April, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, what what's next for Party of Sin? After that, we're just gonna like cruise and finish it off. I mean, we're aiming to release this summer, so there's a lot of work on the game to still do. But now I'm gonna be leaving my job soon. I'm hoping like that extra time is gonna help, like push it to the end. And I mean, it's going to be good to have a break from the trade shows and stuff because it, like, we had MAGFest, which was, like, in January. Then we had a bit of, a bit like, we had the Kickstarter, which was, like, another big milestone. And then we had GDC, and then we had PAX. So it's, like, we've been running, like, two or three weeks of, like, development sprint, and then and then something happens. Right. Um, Get that demo kind of available. Because you can't make, like, the big breaking changes. Like, you can't, you know fix something you, you kind of do quick fixes all the like all the time because you know that like in two weeks you have to present the game and it has to actually work and so there's going to be a bit of a cleanup to do after that and uh just like you know finish up there's a lot of stuff like outside of the game that we still need to do like finish up the menu system finish up exactly what's going to happen between levels like is there going to be a shop and stuff like that and then there's tweaks so i mean there's there's quite a bit of work still to do but we're going to be launching a beta in the next couple of weeks so that's going to be the big the next big task and then get feedback from those people and make the game better and better and then eventually release it what well, that's awesome congratulations on you know all of your work and it it sounds like you know you guys are all set to produce this really awesome game i've had a chance to sit down and play the demo uh, i'm thoroughly impressed you know with with it it was a great experience even if my computer probably needs to be a little bit better but uh <laughs> Yeah, so, optimization is one of the things we actually have to spend a lot of time on. Like, the game is not, it's, it's chugging right now, and it's, you know, I'm not happy about it as a programmer. Right. <laughs> one of the things that you save for the end. Absolutely. And I guess, kind of touching back on the idea behind what I'm trying to do with my column on Baltimore Gamer, is, you know, we're trying to give advice for people just starting out on their first project. So, do you have any advice that you might give to people just starting out? Hmm. Feel free to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's always, like, I mean, there's, there's, like, the simple, like, the cliche stuff, like, oh, don't give up. But, I mean, <laughs> and, and that's important, right? Absolutely. But uh, I'm trying to think, like, if there's any useful. I, I think I think the most, I think the times when, when things were going the toughest for me that was important to remember is, like, it's not always going to go well. Uh, <laughs> like, there's going to be times when, when you're, like, frustrated and, and, like, depressed and, like, the game's not going the way that you want it to and, you know, you're the only one left on the team and, like, everyone else has deserted you or whatever. But, I mean, as long as you keep keep at it, like, keep going and focus on, on the goal that you're trying to reach, it'll work out. And the other thing is, like, all the times that it goes bad, like, it's going to go better right after. Like, you're going to figure something out. Like, usually when, when things are going badly, it's because, like, you're, like, brewing up this idea or something's gonna like it, it's gonna it's gonna click at one point you know 
So I mean, it's important to just like stick it through those tough times, and then and then like make it to the end and focus focus more on the goal instead of focusing on like you know how shitty things are in the present. <laughs> and it, it's definitely always important to have some kind of finished product product even when you're maybe not releasing but you know if you're just starting out you know you need to you need to build up that portfolio so that yeah you can i mean get better. no game i mean the, imp- the other thing is important is like you know you, you pour in tons of time and energy into the game and it's important to realize that like i mean you learn a lot of stuff it's really great but it's kind of useless if you don't actually finish your game i mean if you if you kind of put out something that's half-assed if you don't really think about or, or like put out something you're proud of or, or that like means something to you right then it's like there's not really any point in doing it like it's it's meant to be you know the games that I put out I want them to be meaningful I want them to be like to represent what I think is a good game and it's it's tough to do that I mean execution is like the hardest thing ever but you have to have like a lot of willpower and you have to just like you know put your foot down and just get it done and I guess like I've been I've been lucky in that because I've got like a really stubborn personality. <laughs> but, Helpful personality traits are always good. Yeah, but I mean, there's like, you, you know, there's there's people that that find it a lot tougher, and it's like if you really really want to do it, then then you'll you know you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get it, you're gonna finish, it's gonna it's gonna happen, right? Absolutely. Well, I think that's probably about all the time I have for. This has been a really great interview. We've been here with. Daniel Mayer from uh, Crankshaft Games, and their game is coming out soon. Party of Feel free to uh, check it out.